Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Ed Mast. I'm going to talk a bit about the FreeBSD tool chain. I was thinking about uh, doing a, a last minute rewrite of my presentation and giving a presentation on LibTrue instead, but I think uh, uh, it's a little bit too exciting, so um, I'm going to, going to stick with the original topic. So, <laughs> So I'll explain briefly, uh, very briefly, what I mean by the tool chain in FreeBSD. And so it's anything that transforms source code into some sort of derived binary artifact or, or derived artifact um, of that uh, earlier object. And this can be a progression uh, through multiple stages, source code to object file to, um, to executable, for example. Here we, would, we have, say, a C++ source file that's trans, uh, transformed into a executable that you might run. Um, or we can have C source and C++ source that are combined by a linker um, into a single executable or a shared object. Um, and we might have assembly source that's uh, processed by an assembler and combined with, with those other components. And we have libraries, system libraries, the, the C library and other um, parts of the system that are, are linked into that executable you might produce. And we might have tools that take the binary or shared object and process it in some way, um, take an elf object and, and do something else with it. So for example, we can produce a shared object or a binary and then split it into two, two components. So we might have debug information in one piece and the original binary or shared object itself in, in another piece so that um, the two pieces can be managed separately. You can ship just the binary and keep the debug info uh, for use um, elsewhere, install it only if you need it, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's also ancillary tools like the debugger, um, which we'll use for tracing program execution, uh, single stepping, or post-mortem analysis if you have a crash. Um, and then tools like editors are sort of broadly speaking part of the tool chain, but, uh, but not uh, part of my presentation. So I'm talking about really the, the tools that we ship with the base system in FreeBSD to be able to make it self-host, self um, be able to reproduce itself, and basic ancillary tools, so um, uh, the debugger is included in that. And in FreeBSD, uh, from the beginning, we were using the, the GNU toolchain, um, GCC, bin utils, GDB, uh, and the, the GNU folks would release new versions on a regular basis, and we would bring, um, bring those versions into FreeBSD. So the, the sort of light blue cyan um, upper or gray upper bar is, represents release dates from um, GCC and GDB components, and then the purpley magenta bar below represents the point at which we imported it into FreeBSD. And you can see that for the most part, um, within a month or, or you know, maybe a, a little bit longer, we would import a new version of, um, of those components, tracking most upstream releases. Uh, and a few, a few exceptions, sometimes it took a little while longer to, um, to import uh, into FreeBSD, but we, we followed along fairly closely. And the FSF kept releasing new versions, and we generally, in GCC at least, we were bringing, bringing new versions in. Um, you notice that in 2005, was the last time we imported a, uh, a GDB debugger. Um, and there are a couple of different reasons for that. Um, but basically, uh, the upstream, every time a new upstream release would come out, we, it might need changes to adapt to newer versions of, of FreeBSD. Um, and over time, there were, there were growing difficulties collaborating within the project and with upstream. Um, and so it became more and more difficult to bring new versions of, uh, of GDB into the, the FreeBSD based system. And so, pardon me? There's some history there that uh, some folks in the project can share over, uh, over a beer. It largely predates my, my direct uh, involvement in these things. Um, but in any case, it doesn't really matter. The point is that um, since, uh, since more than a decade ago, we haven't imported a new version of the debugger. And we also stopped importing new versions of GCC. And why is that? Well, in the middle of 2007, the Free Software Foundation released version 3 of the GPL, and it had some restrictions that were unpalatable to a number of FreeBSD developers and FreeBSD users. 
Um, and so we basically, as a project, decided, and I think this is true for, um, the B for other BSDs in general, um, decided we, we much prefer um, uh, permissively licensed toolchain components. And in FreeBSD, we just stopped importing new versions of, of GDB and GCC. Um, some other BSDs have, have split it so that they have a GPLv2 and a GPLv3 toolchain in the, the tree. Um, OpenBSD, I think, doesn't have uh, a GPLv3 tr uh, tree at all. NetBSD, I think, has a GPLv3 compiler for architectures that, that require it. But um, FreeBSD and, and OpenBSD, we, we just said we don't want GPLv3. So a, a search uh, came on for a, a new, a new toolchain. Um, and in FreeBSD, we've got quite a lot of architectures. This is kind of a high-level map of uh, everything from uh, relating FreeBSD architecture support, um, FreeBSD versions, and uh, uh, the specific component, uh, GC, the compiler, assembler, et cetera, and the source of um, the, the source of that toolchain component for that architecture and that version. And I don't expect you to actually be able to, to read it. Um, my point in, in showing all of this is just to, to really uh, demonstrate from a high level, we have a multitude of, of different uh, different components um, coming from different sources in the FreeBSD toolchain on different architectures. But one thing that is, um, is interesting that you, you can see from this high-level view, so if we look at the columns here, which are our FreeBSD versions across uh, from left to right, FreeBSD 9.x uh, is on the left, and earlier versions basically would, would follow the same um, the same sources, just different versions. But you can see that in, in FreeBSD 9 and earlier, um, it's all red. We basically used a single source of toolchain components um, leading up to, to FreeBSD 9. Uh, and I'll explain the colors in just a moment. But we basically had a single uh, cohesive toolchain across all architectures. And then starting in FreeBSD 10, um, we switched to st using Clang on a number of architectures and still had GCC here on a, a number of them. And you can see that you know, over time, um, as, as we progressed, we get more of this sort of mix, and then in some places we have this light yellow color showing up. So we, we're in a, in a world right now in FreeBSD where we have three main sources of components leading into the, the tool chain. Um, and it's not a great place to be, but uh, as we go sort of into the future, you can see that we're, we're looking to get back to um, one or two, converging back onto one or two. So the, the, the color scheme, um, basically, the red were tr tr tools that are in the FreeBSD tree, um, basically the GPL uh, GNU tools, and are outdated at this point. The green ones are uh, maintained tr tools in the FreeBSD tree, and so this is um, now Clang and uh, Elf Toolchain and other uh, similar tools. And the new category that's in here um, relatively recently is this yellow one that's uh, tools that are coming out of the FreeBSD ports tree. Um, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and these basically uh, document the state of the world as it exists today. So we, clearly the tools weren't, uh, weren't outdated obsolete tools at the time we imported them. Um, they were just uh, the, uh, the GNU tools that we imported and they were up to date and they just haven't been updated in a long time. So looking specifically at the compiler, um, the C and C++ compiler. As I said, we had GCC um, across all architectures. In FreeBSD 10, um, in January 2014, we switched to Clang uh, for our, basically our, our tier one architectures. Um, <coughs> and as we, we go across from left to right, uh, basically FreeBSD 10, 10.0 is the first release with Clang, 10.x represents stable 10 as, as it exists in the, brand, in the tree today. FreeBSD 11 was the FreeBSD 11 release, and then 11.x is stable 11 as it is, exists today. What I'm calling soon here is either what's in FreeBSD head, or um, maybe is a work in progress branch, or there's patches in review. It's, it's either in the tree right now, or it's sort of right on the, the horizon. And later represents maybe uh, what we hope to do for 12.0, or after 12.0. So we still used, um, even after we switched to Clang, we still used the old GCC for the tier two and, and lower architectures, MIPS, PowerPC, Spark 64. And one thing that's interesting, uh, and, and it's sort of um, 
we almost sort of need a, 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 another column, which is um, actually right now and, and very soon. Uh, but risk five represents an, a, a, the beginning of an experiment for us um, where we rely, we have an architecture in the tree that relies on external tool chain. So this diverges from the historical BSD model of having everything, um, everything in the tree and have it self-hosting. And this basically was a way of allowing us to develop and um, work with risk five uh, without without being being stuck on on having a tool chain available it makes releases tricky and it makes um, it makes development somewhat tricky but it's still a much more convenient user workflow um, than alternatives Warner um, I64 and alpha the so Um, what what did we do for um, for the tool chain though? Like, did we? How did we actually ship it? We didn't uh, do releases until we had the tool chain in the tree. So, so that part is new. Like, yeah. Pulled new releases in before we had the tool chain completely. Uh, our new architectures in before we had the tool chain in completely. So FreeBSD, we started off with i386 as the primary architecture, added alpha um, in the 3.x time frame, and over time. Um, a couple of architectures have been added, and or lots of architectures have been added. A few architectures have been been removed um, to get us to where we are today. So, w as we did with GCC early on, we've been tracking uh, updates to Clang on an ongoing basis. And so, each time there was a, a, a Clang update, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5 through to 3.9, 4.0, and then after 4.0 comes 5.0, uh, and then next 6.0. Um, so the numbering scheme has changed. But as new releases came out from, from Clang and LLVM, we imported them into to FreeBSD. Um, and we do that for many reasons, bug fixes, uh, new C++ and C standard support. So 3.3, um, when we switched to it, it had full C++11 support. Um, 3.4 added C++, uh, full C++14 support. And C++1Z features are kind of scattered throughout later versions um, so that Clang should have full C++1Z support when it actually becomes a, um, uh, a final uh, standard. And as we bring in new, uh, new compilers, Existing code might fail to build, so either the base system or ports, we may find that um, the, the source code that used to build just fine with the older compiler no longer does um, for a number of different, different reasons. And so we've started a, um, the last couple of releases of, of Clang. Um, we've switched to a model where to stage an import, we're bringing Clang into a projects branch um, as, so in this case, um, uh, it would be Clang 500-import to do the work of uh, updating to support Clang 5 in FreeBSD. And so that allows us to iterate on bringing the base system up to uh, correcting um, the base system source code to, to work with Clang. And then also um, <coughs> it allows us to e more easily test the ports tree with the updated compiler. So in, in the ports uh, collection, it's about 27,000 different pieces of software in the FreeBSD ports tree, and this is what we use to build packages from, and uh, individual end users can install uh, or build that software using the ports tree for their own, their own systems. Um, so we have this concept called an XP run, which is an experimental build of the entire 27,000 pieces of software in the FreeBSD ports tree with some patch applied to the, the base system source tree or to the ports um, uh, source repository. And then we collect the results and see what, uh, what, which ports newly fail as a result of the changes that we've introduced. So we've been doing this for the last couple of imports. This is the, uh, the request for an XP run for the Clang 500 import branch. And with, Clang, with the Clang 500 branch as it exists today, there's about 40 failures, uh, 40 failing ports, which is actually quite small out of the 27,000. Um, and 70, uh, 75 ports are skipped, which means those ports have a dependency on one of the ones that is now failing. Uh, and so 
we have a, a number of different kinds of cases uh, as to why things fail when we update to a new compiler. And here's an example of uh, uh, imports out of uh, MongoDB. Um, so it's, this is a fairly common, uh, common idiom that, that exists in, in many uh, third-party source trees um, where a pointer is compared with an integer um, with a, a um, uh, not an equality comparison, but um, you know, either greater than zero or, or similar cases, and it's, it's just not, uh, it's not valid. Uh, and Clang 5 is, um, refuses to, to, uh, to build that. And so we'll, we'll need to either work around, uh, we need to get a fix for these sorts of things into the upstream software eventually, but we have workarounds we can, um, can apply in, in the short term to, to continue moving on. And one thing I, I uh, also want to mention is Clang, uh, the Clang 500 branch, Clang 5 isn't yet released. It's, it's the Clang version that's going to be the next release of Clang. So we are tracking the development that's happening in Clang's subversion uh, repository and eventually Clang's Git in our repository. So the last update we did um, in FreeBSD was um, about five or six days ago. Um, so the Clang 500 branch in FreeBSD is up to date within, uh, you know, we keep it up to date within weeks of, of what's happening in Clang so that we can find, um, find issues long before the compiler gets released. And one of the things that that's good for um, is that we also find errors in Clang when we do this um, because we have a corpus of 27,000 pieces of software we're trying to build. Um, and so in this case, there's an assertion that we, trip, we tripped over in Clang and we'll, you know, we'll generate a, um, a bug report um, and, the, and, and send it to the LLVM development community. The FreeBSD developers who work on the tool chain internally, generally speaking, also work in the upstream LLVM community. So Dimitri Andrik, who does a lot of the, most of the work on bringing Clang versions in, is an, a committer in Clang and LLVM. Um, I'm also a committer in Clang and LLVM as well as FreeBSD. So we work very closely to make sure that we can, say, reduce a um, test case from a failure when we try and build some very large piece of software to something that's, that's small that we can send upstream and have people iterate on to fix, uh, to fix there. And this is something that provides an incredible amount of value to both FreeBSD and to the LLVM community and to the upstream software communities. So if we look at uh, Clang usage in the ports um, over time, the, the darker blue kind of bars rep, uh, show the number of make files in the ports tree for the ports make files. And you can see we're, we're about 27,000 uh, right now. And the orangey red color represents, um, on the, the right axis here, represents the, the percentage of ports that are tagged with use underscore GCC, which is forcing those ports to build with GCC. So that's one of the ways that we can work around problems with Clang. If, if some piece of software doesn't compile with Clang, either because it relies on GCC extensions or it's just, um, you know, it relies on some sort of undefined behavior that GCC implements in a certain way, we can force it to use GCC and force it to use a specific version of GCC. So some of these, uh, you know, it's, it's been in there for a very long time and some of the early uses were to force specific versions of GCC. Uh, and you can see that right now we're, we're under uh, a percent or so of the, the ports that are forcing that use underscore GCC um, setting. And there's other ways that ports might end up using GCC. For example, any port right now that is tagged as using OpenMP gets compiled with GCC and there's, there's a few other cases. But I'm just trying to illustrate the, the general trend here. The interesting thing is that you can see that in 2013 is, is when FreeBSD 10 came out and we made the switch to Clang for our, our tier one architectures. And you know, there was a, a fairly significant increase in the, the use of, of forcing GCC. And then over time, you know, it's been decreasing as, um, as we reinvestigate why some of those changes, uh, why some of those ports were overridden to use GCC. And as Clang um, implements functionality, that supports the kinds of, uh, of needs we had. So next I'll talk briefly about the assembler. Uh, so the assembler takes assembly source and turns it into an object <laughs> file. And as with other things, you know, we, we started off with um, a version of binutils. 2.17.50 is the last binutils version released under GPL v2. And it's the, the version that's used in lots of projects that have um, have a desire not to move beyond GPLv2 tools. And of course, you know, it, was, it was consistent across all of our architectures and has been, uh, been 
becoming increasingly stale over time. Unlike, uh, unlike Clang, though, we didn't really have an, a compelling alternative for, for quite a while. The only exception here is ARM 64, um, it's a 64 bit ARM architecture, <laughs> where we actually, this was actually a, a slightly um, earlier experiment with using external toolchain. So for, for ARM 64, when we released in 11.0, we shipped with the in tree Clang being able to compile for ARM 64, but we still relied on an external bin utils to be able to link uh, and assemble. But the interesting thing is that now, as of uh, FreeBSD, um, uh, as, as in head right now, and as of FreeBSD, uh, uh, as in FreeBSD 11 stable, what will become 11.1, we've switched to, um, to using Clang's integrated assembler. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Andy? Right, so a Andy points out we were using the integrated assembler here. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a moment um, as to why we use, wh where we use either the integrated assembler or, uh, or a standalone assembler. But the interesting point is that very shortly, I expect, we'll be able to switch to using the integrated assembler for all of our architectures um, and switch to relying on the, uh, a, a ports tree version of bin utils for the, the tier two and lower architectures. So the interesting thing about the assembler is that very little actually requires a user bin AS. It's not in POSIX, it's, it's not sort of expected um, to be there by any standard. Um, and so I asked for an X run to try and build ports without user bin AS existing. Um, AMD64 fared well, the uh, world end um, kernel built just fine, and then uh, I think there were, um, so there were 11 ports that failed on AMD64 when user bin AS didn't exist, and it was QMU, um, some other emulator, uh, seven programming languages, so things like MIT Scheme and OCaml, uh, and uh, uh, some multimedia library um, didn't build. So it's a relatively small set, and then quite a bit of um, uh, downstream fallout. Um, uh, of skipped ports that depended on one of these that, that didn't build. And the reason that it gets, um, that we use either the integrated assembler or AS in different ways, um, we have assembly files that have a capital S and assembly files that have a lowercase s in the source tree. Um, and for a lot of people, this was just sort of a mystery. The, the way it works is that capital S assembly files are processed by the C preprocessor and lowercase assembly files are sent to the assembler directly. Um, and so this is across all architectures. We have 750 um, uh, capital S assembly files on, um, on all of our architectures and for AMD64, that was, at the time the, that the XP run was performed, that was all of the assembly files used on AMD64. In the time since um, the XP run, we, we ended up introducing a single assembly file that um, is passed directly to the assembler. And it can't be assembled by Clang's integrated assembler because it uses GCC's macro, um, macro support. Uh, that's guess. Sorry. Uh, GAS's macro support, um, which is not supported by the integrated assembler or the other, um, uh, the other alternative assemblers that are available. So things like YASM, um, none of them support exactly the, support the full set at least of macro use that, um, that GAS does. So we're, we're a little bit stuck, um, but since it is only one, uh, one assembly file that has this problem, you know, there's a number of alternatives we can do. We can, we can rewrite this single file to avoid use of the, um, the macro uh, directive and expand it, to, uh, uh, expand it out in line. We'll need to do a lot of testing to make sure that we haven't broken it in doing that. We could also do something like uh, assemble it with, um, with the GNU assembler and then disassemble it 
and take the disassembly and turn that back into what we're going to feed back into uh, an assembler that doesn't support macro. Uh, none of these are particularly particularly nice, but it's a, a very tractable problem because it's, it is only one case. Um, for I386, in a lot of cases, we can just rename the lowercase s files to uppercase s and let, um, let Clang IAS take care of it. Um, but again, it, it needs a lot of testing to, to do it. But that is, that's my, my goal for moving forward with those. Do you know what part is missing? Because what .macro is implementing MC. Yeah, I'm not sure what specifically. Uh, I guess that, that's a, a good point. Another alternative is that we can work to, to, to extend the macro support in the integrated assembler um, to, to, to implement what we, we need. Next, we have the linker. And again, we've, um, we're using a relatively ancient uh, BFD linker on all architectures, uh, still until FreeBSD 11. Um, and as with uh, the assembler, sort of similar case, uh, this is the reason we really needed to bring in the bin utils port. Um, the, to bring in the bin utils port for ARM64 builds, because we needed a linker. Um, and we've now in FreeBSD 12 and in FreeBSD 11.1 when it comes out, we'll be using LLVM's LLD linker for ARM64. And then LLD works, um, works today for AMD64. My laptop is running FreeBSD um, built about five days ago with LLD as the linker and it generally works um, just fine. I386 has a few problems. We can't build the uh, we can't build kernel modules on I386 with LLD today, and our 32-bit uh, ARM has a another uh, problem linking libc. So they're fairly close for the the other tier one or or close to tier one architectures, but not fully there yet. Uh, and the the goal is to get rid of um, the ancient bin utils and the ancient GCC in time for FreeBSD 12. So the the, uh, the likely path is going to be to migrate to requiring uh, external bin utils ports to build architectures that don't have entry toolchain support. So I just wanted to talk briefly about LLVM's uh, LLD because it's, uh, it's quite an interesting case. Um, LLD existed in the LLVM project for quite a while. It was based on the Mako uh, Atom model and had a port to, to ELF of that functionality, building on kind of, um, ex building on top of if, uh, infrastructure and libraries that, um, that were shared with, with the Atom uh, Mako linker. But it, it was a, a fairly um, poor match. It didn't really work, uh, work very well. So in, in 2015, um, uh, Rui Uyama from Google implemented a new cough linker from scratch in LLD. And it was basically two linkers in one. So it had you know, one code path that handled Mako and ELF and old cough, and one code path that was a brand new, uh, completely decoupled uh, cough linker. And shortly after, Michael Spencer took that design and implemented a, a, a new ELF linker. So we had three linkers in one. We had a standalone cough linker, a standalone ELF linker, and then all the rest. Um, but the interesting thing is that about half a year later, LLD could self-host on FreeBSD. Um, so the ELF, the ELF support progressed significantly faster when done this way, um, rather than trying to build it on top of what was the, the, the common infrastructure that didn't really match. So in 2016, there was uh, some, some really significant progress on LLD. Um, many people uh, upstream worked on, on LLD, but I've listed a few folks here who worked specifically um, to improve FreeBSD support in LLD or, or fixed generic LLD problems that were identified as a result of FreeBSD trying to start using it. Um, and some of the features that, we, uh, that were implemented in 2016 um, that were important for us. Probably the uh, linker script and symbol versioning support were the two key things that didn't exist elsewhere and were very important for FreeBSD, uh, FreeBSD's linker use. And I basically sort of found issues. I ran lots of tests trying to use, uh, trying to build world and build kernel with, with LLD and submitted um, bugs and worked with the upstream uh, folks to, to get those in and have 
a lot of sort of minor improvements, bug fixes across the tree. And then once we had a linker that was getting close, we again asked for an X run with LLD installed as user bin LD. And in this case, uh, it was actually quite surprising. Only 270 ports um, failed when trying to use LLD, and you know about a thousand were skipped because they depended on one of the ones that failed. Which I think for um, uh, for swapping out uh, a linker with one that's only been uh, been around for a relatively short period of time is quite impressive. Um, so that's we got about 94 percent or so of the ports tree to build with with LLD. And there's one key uh, issue that's preventing a lot of them, that's responsible for a lot of those failures. Um, a lot of software ends up trying to access a protected symbol from a shared, uh, shared library and uh, a, sh a symbol defined with a protect vis protected visibility. With some hackish patches to work around that in the ports tree, basically, um, you know, telling you, we, it's fairly straightforward, although hackish, to, 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 to get individual ports um, to build to, and avoid this issue, we get to uh, all but around 1% or 2% of the ports building with LLD. So my expectation for moving forward on this will be very similar to what we did with Clang, or with, um, with, with the introduction of Clang. We'll, be, we'll add some um, annotation in individual ports make files to say that they don't work with uh, LLD or that they require, that they require bin utils. Um, and over time, we'll, we'll, as, as either the upstream port gets fixed to avoid this problem or as LLD gains new functionality, we'll strip those back out and uh, allow those ports to build with the in-tree linker. So my, my expectation is that we will make that change before FreeBSD 12. So this graph here, I think, really shows why L, uh, LLD is, is interesting to a lot of developers. So this is the time to, the real time for linking a Clang release build. And the BFD uh, linker that we have in base, GNU LD, takes over 40 seconds of real time. Um, new versions of BFD linker from ports were down to 3.7 seconds, so a, a pretty significant um, speed up. Gold uh, is about a second and a half, and then LLD threaded or non-threaded is about half a second. Um, and the difference between you know 3.7 uh, seconds, 1.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, that's not a a, uh, a showstopper. But when we look at linking something even larger, so a um, a debug build of Clang, in this case, it was almost five minutes for BFD to link that, um, a minute and a half for the BFD linker from ports. Gold was um, over half a minute, and then LLD almost 19 seconds uh, without threads, and 11.6 seconds uh, with threads. And this is on some arbitrary desktop machine that I uh, I tested on. Which Pardon me. Which file system? Uh, on UFS. Um, but we we have, we have achieved a 25% uh, speed up over the 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 BFD linker in the base system. Um, there's, there's some really interesting performance numbers um, in a more scientific benchmarking um, perspective, uh, you know, running the link on, um, uh, on a, from a memory file system. My goal here was to just kind of see, you know, for the, the user, usual FreeBSD developer workflow of building the base system, what kind of effects are we going to expect to see um, as a direct end user, as a direct developer, and it's pretty significant. And LLD also um, has been intended to uh, support threaded operation and, and uh, from the beginning. And this is uh, just a, um, a close-up view of the gold versus LLD unthreaded versus LLD threaded um, performance from that last graph. So we're about two times uh, unthreaded gold and um, about three times when LLD is threaded. In this case, gold was not threaded. This was the default configuration in the ports tree. Um, we can, so in the ports tree, gold could, could achieve a speed up by turning on threads, but I expect that there's some reason that hasn't been done, um, either because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't stable at the time, or I'm not sure, uh, possibly some other reasons. So next steps for the linker. <coughs> 
there's a, a few uh, simple things and a few more exciting things that we can do when we have LLD available. One of them, the fairly simple ones, is to enable build ID. And so this is uh, a scheme that takes a hash of all of the, at least all of the significant components of the shared object or executable. Um, it could be the entire thing, but it, it doesn't have to be. All of the, at least all of the loadable, um, loadable significant parts of that executable generates a unique identifier for that binary and stores it in an ELF section. And the reason this is interesting is it allows us to do things like locate the original binary for a core file. So the, the build ID gets stored into core files and the original binary can be found um, located automatically if you have the core file. Um, it can be used to, to tie together a binary and its debug objects. Um, and so either to locate the debug file for a binary and, and also to confirm that they're, they're a proper match. Uh, LTO is also a, a, an in, a, a much more significant, significant improvement that's going to come out of using LLD. So LLTO is link time optimization. Um, it's whole program optimization performed at link time. And I I in brief, what happens is that all of the interme intermediate objects that are combined into a, uh, an executable or shared object at, at final link time are stored as LLVM, LLVM IR and only converted um, to machine instructions um, when that final link happens. And this allows LLVM's optimizer to run over the entire program and uh, either eliminate uh, unused, um, uh, unused code or uh, perform any of the, the sort of standard optimizations that LLVM can do across the entire program, not just a single object at a time. Um, that we will add a mechanism to override um, override the linker for individual ports, uh, as I alluded to earlier. And once I, th I think that as soon as that's done, um, we'll be able to switch AMD64 over to LLD. Jim, you had a question? Turn on O3 or O4 with this, you lose explicit B0. Um, Jim, Jim's uh, points out turning on L uh, O3 or O4 um, loses explicit B0. Uh, so I think. Yeah, specific cases like that, um, you know, we, we, will, we will definitely need, uh, need, need to ensure that um, uh, regressions aren't, aren't introduced. It's the, the LTO work specifically is a little bit more experimental in general um, at this point. I don't, it is possible with what's in the FreeBSD tree today to do, uh, to start experimenting with LTO builds, um, but there's a few things that are a little bit hacky and it's not, um, not really something we can, uh, we can do in production just yet. Um, and then following that, um, we need effort on some of the uh, less, uh, the slightly less popular architectures. Um, so at this point, 32-bit uh, ARM and x86 fall into that category. Um, they're fairly close with LLD, but not quite there. MIPS and PowerPC are also coming along, but um, but need some significant um, effort. And then working through the backlog of issues in the ports tree. Um, Basically, all of the cases where we've used an override to say use the bin utils LD explicitly, we'll want to go through and invest and take to root cause why we had to enable that and fix that in LLD or in the, the upstream port. We have quite a few assorted small binary utilities in FreeBSD. Um, as with the assembler and the linker in the uh, mentioned earlier in the, the original case, these these typically came from the bin utils project. And so you know, we had bin utils 2.17.50 up until 10.x. In FreeBSD 11, we switched to the ELF toolchain project as a source for these small tools, with the exception of, a of ARM64, which had the external, um, uh, the external bin utils in addition. So although we really only needed the linker um, from bin utils for ARM64, we actually ended up with uh, two copies of NM and two copies of strings and all of those sorts of tools. Um, the internal ones provided by FreeBSD and the, the ones from the external port. So Elf Tool Chain is a project that was started by Joseph Kashi and Kai Wang, um, who were FreeBSD developers, and took a number of uh, bespoke tools from FreeBSD, so things like AR and Elf Dump, um, moved them into an external repository, 
and tried to develop them there with a goal of, of bringing other people outside of the FreeBSD project into working on um, a shared non-GNU toolchain. Um, it, it's unclear how successful that was. Um, it ha the, the project has attracted contributions from other than the FreeBSD community um, and other than the original developers, but not significantly so yet. Uh, but in any case, they started with a, with a few tools obtained from FreeBSD and then went through and implemented new versions uh, or additional, uh, additional tools in the, the, the collection. So this is a map of um, sort of the, the native POSIX, uh, POSIX and, and historic native tools um, and, and where their relationship to ELF toolchain. So you can see that for things like C++, FILT, NM, size, strings, and strip, we now get out of, um, out of ELF toolchain instead of their historical sources. Um, ELF toolchain provides a very rough implementation of a linker. Um, it's not something that uh, we're looking at, at using. And there's uh, a number of tools that were introduced by GNU that ELF toolchain provides implementations of as well. So. Um, Read Elf, I think, is a pretty common one. Um, Elf Copy is the tool for manipulating Elf objects, and converting them from one format to another, or stripping sections, or doing that sort of thing. Um, it's in in uh, GNU bin utils. It's called Objdump, and the Elf toolchain people called it Elf Dump originally because it operated only on Elf files. It has since grown to uh, be able to read and write binary files and output uh, SREC and hex and other formats. So in FreeBSD, we install it as OpsCopy and it's command line equivalent and, and basically functionally equivalent to what GNU OpsCopy provides. And ELF Toolchain has uh, a number of libraries included with it as well. LibElfTC and LibPE are internal libraries to support the rest of the tools, but LibElf for reading and writing ELF files and LibDwarf for manipulating dwarf debug info. Um, uh, Lib, uh, ELF Toolchain provides a, um, a, a separate implementation of those. So that, What's pardon me. LibMC um, Lib is is their their planned equivalent to BFD. Basically, it's a machine code um, uh, library. It would be used for the assembler and the disassembler and that sort of thing. So we have a collection of tools that are are still bespoke in FreeBSD. Uh, I would like to move these to come from the same source as, as others. Right now, we have AR, um, for example, or ELF dump. We have some changes in FreeBSD that uh, have happened since the ELF toolchain split, split off, and we've had changes in the ELF toolchain project since they started. So uh, it's, it would be a regression for us to just drop what we have in the base system and switch to these, but I would like to rationalize them and bring them all from a single source. And the, the one question we have uh, down here is objdump. Um, which is, it's also not a required tool, um, and we could just say anyone who needs to use Objdump install it from the ports. It, it really is more uh, important to have Objdump as a developer. Um, it's generally not a good idea for, uh, for scripts and things to rely on Objdump. Um, but in any case, LLVM has an LLVM Objdump, which is broadly compatible, accepts many of the same command line arguments. The output format is, uh, is a bit different but it, it does provide um, the use cases that most people use Objump for. So uh, disassembling object files or mixed source and, and disassembly, um, LLVM Objump works reasonably well for that. What on earth have you changed from AR? Pardon me? What, what are the changes to AR? Um, what, one, uh, one thing we've done in AR in FreeBSD for sure that isn't in, uh, in ELF toolchain's copy is added capsicum uh, compartmentalization support to it. Um, there's a few other, other minor, uh, minor changes. I, I, it's not a lot of work, I think, to rationalize the two. Uh, it's just that the AR that we have in the base system basically is, is completely usable for us, so there's not a huge benefit. Um, we're not gaining any new features by switching, um, to migrating to the other one. It really is just to sort of avoid, um, avoid having um, conflicting tools. The one reason, though, that I, I do would want to try and uh, reduce the number of individual uh, sources for, for tools like this is that for LTO, um, we want to have an AR that can deal with um, LLVM IR in object files uh, 
Um, and the one previously you also used at least the extremely slow. That's kind of the like was actually slower to build the archives and to leave the kind of. So there, there may be performance uh, performance reasons as well. LLVM has an LLVM AR um, that we might be able to uh, we, sh we should look at at using as well. Um, but it's still, uh, all that will happen sort of as we start trying to flesh out uh, LTO, LTO, LTO plans. Uh, what I would say is that for small tools that you, might ex that you would, would expect to install on an end target system, so things like strings um, or size, you may well want one of those installed on your target, even if you don't have a full tool chain. Strings especially, um, and so for those tools, I expect that we'll continue to use a small version out of Elf Toolchain, even if we did start importing um, heavier weight LLVM versions of, of the tools in general. A few other miscellaneous tools we have: um, Device Tree Compiler. So this is uh, uh, originated sort of in open firmware, and so um, uh, Device Tree in general is a scheme for describing hardware and is, is of tip. Is typically of interest in FreeBSD for uh, embedded ARM uh, devices. And David Chisdell implemented a bespoke version of the device tree compiler. The upstream device tree compiler, the compiler itself is GPL'd. Um, the, there's a, sh a corresponding library that's dual B uh, BSD and GPL licensed that can parse and operate on device tree files, but the the compiler itself that turns device tree source files into device tree binaries um, is GPL'd. David Chisnell has a, an implementation that we have in, um, in the source tree and is under a build time knob to turn it on. It was on for some period of time. Um, an update to the DTS files in the FreeBSD tree um, basically made it, uh, made it stop working. It didn't support some features that were added in newer DTS files. Um, it, it now is fully functional and uh, implements all of the, the support that we need. So it's a, um, a matter of, of testing and verification to make sure that all of the, the platforms we care about um, continue to work if we want to switch it back on. Warner? Including overlays? Overlay, overlays work, yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I. Uh, um, last time I tried it, that was the impediment. When, when did you last try it? Well, like January. Uh, I'm, I believe I've imported it since then. Okay. Um, I'll try again. Yeah, M maybe by the end of the talk you can uh, let me know. Um, I, so I, I, have, I have built um, the entire FreeBSD universe um, using the, device, uh, the BSD license device tree compiler. Uh, set as the, the default. Also the debugger. Um, it's not required for self-hosting, but it is a pretty important component of a traditional BSD-based system. And again, we had an um, outdated version of GNU GDB across all architectures. And in FreeBSD 11, we imported uh, LLVM's LLDB. So this is a project that originated uh, initially in Apple, and it's the debugger that went with Xcode. Um, now Apple and Google are putting pretty significant amounts of effort into it. Um, it still has a ways to go both upstream and in, in FreeBSD. Um, and it's not completely compatible and doesn't cover all cases. I'll mention a bit about that in a moment. So. I expect that our, our path forward for the debugger in FreeBSD will be a combination of using LLDB in the tree and uh, first class GDB port support. So one of the things that's happened um, since 10 years ago plus when we had the outdated uh, GDB is John Baldwin has put a lot of effort into updating the, the GDB ports and getting all of the architecture support that existed only in FreeBSD into upstream GDB port. And so for people who have finger memory, who are really familiar with GDB, the, the GDB, GDB ports on FreeBSD now work really well and support kernel debugging. Um, I'll mention that in a second. LLDB is, is built as a set of reusable components as with uh, the sort of general LLVM philosophy. And it builds on components that come from Clang or LLVM. So one of the interesting things about that is that 
the expression parser in LLV or in LLDB is actually just Clang. So when you say print some sort of complicated C++ expression, it's Clang turning that internally into LLVM IR and executing it. So it's a very it provides a very high fidelity expression parser. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about it is it is usable as a component from a front end or from a scripting language. So the, there's the traditional LLDB command line that we provide in FreeBSD, and, and it uses the um, LLDB library. There's a Python. Um, um, you can use LLDB as a Python module. So this is not invoking Python scripts from within the debugger, but importing the debugger into um, a Python script. And then it can function as uh, th the support for various IDEs. So Xcode is, is the, the usual example. There's some open source ones that can, can make use of it as well. Next steps for the debugger, we need to add uh, AVX register support for, uh, for AMD64 to make it a fully usable userland debugger. That's a fairly straightforward project. Um, the debug server is uh, it's a, a small stub that's used typically for remote debugging. So it'll run on a target system that's, um, that's separate from where you're running the debugger and executes the debuggy under that, um, that stub. <coughs> and we don't, have, we don't have one available for FreeBSD today. There's a few different uh, implementations that might, that might work. But one of the interesting things about LLDB is that it actually uses, it, on other architectures, um, so not on FreeBSD and not on the original import of the Linux support, but on the, the Linux support is now built this way. It, LLDB actually uses the debug server even for local debugging. So the interesting thing about that is it means that you know your remote debugging case is always going to work properly because ro remote debugging and local debugging is, is the same. Um, and it also simplifies the debugger internals a little bit because it doesn't have to have this other process attached to it, um, to the process that's driving your UI and, and is heavily threaded and, and things like that. We need to add kernel debug support, so both um, both crash dump handling and live debugging against dev mem, dev mem. and fork following is a nice feature to, to have to make it a fully um, fully usable userland debugger. We didn't have that in in GDB 6.1, um, and it, I, I don't think it's a it, it's not at all a hard requirement, but it is it is something that that Im improves usability quite a bit. We also have dtrace uh, related tools. CTF is the, compre uh, the compact um, format for debug information that's used to drive dtrace. And the way we generate it right now is using two tools that imported from OpenSolaris slash Illumos. Um, so we, take, we, we first compile an object file with dwarf. CTF convert runs on that dwarf uh, information in the object file and converts it to, uh, to CTF. And then CTF merge takes the CTF from a number of object files and combines it into one. Um, it's a little bit awkward. OpenBSD developers are working on a BSD licensed implementation rather than the CDDL, um, CTF convert and CTF merge that do it as a single step. Um, and so we're looking at, at that work that's going on. And then longer term, it would be really nice to, to integrate this nat <coughs> natively and transparently into the tool chain so that the, the Clang um, uh, compiler driver and linker can just um, just produce the output that we want directly. Baptiste? Well, in longer term, you don't need, with the open PSD version, you don't need that anymore because you build the memory and at the end you switch to convert the dwarf to uh, CTF1. So you, because you don't need the CTF convert anymore. Also, it converts the merge for yes. the end. Okay. So convert and merge are mixed into one single binary. So you will normally end up if you take a binary and say, oh, give me the CTF for that. Perfect. And finally, the, um, the last sort of component about the, of the tool chain that um, uh, I want to talk about very briefly because I'm coming close to the end of my time um, is all of the runtime support libraries. And there's, there's quite a lot um, uh, to go over in, in this um, very brief uh, remaining time. So we've got the compiler runtime that supports optimized routines and implements functionality that the compiler doesn't want to implement in line. So say floating point math conversions, byte swapping routines, uh, assembly optimized versions of, of things like that. Um, the compiler, if, it's, if there's anything that's too complex for the compiler to generate directly, it'll emit a call to one of these support routines. Uh, in the GCC world, that's libgcc. In the LLVM world, the project is called compiler RT. 
Um, we've sort of done an incremental migration to using the LLVM versions over time because we have cases where we're building either one ar some, some architectures with GCC and some architectures with Clang, or during the transition we had a build knob, and so you might build sometimes with Clang and sometimes with GCC on the same architecture. So quite a while ago, um, long before we, we even switched to Clang, we, were, um, we, we used LLVM's implementation of the compiler built-ins for the static linking case, at least, um, libgcc.a. And much more recently, so only at the end of last year, um, we've in introduced libgcc.s, um, the shared version of the, co the uh, support routines being built from LLVM's implementation. Uh, and there's a little bit more about that in a second. The um, libc, uh, it's sort of a core, it, it is the core piece of, uh, of runtime support on any BSD. Um, FreeBSD, FreeBSD's libc has existed in some form or another basically longer than I've been alive. Um, but for, for recently we have a couple of um, uh, updates to support C++11 in libc. C++ requires a couple of different runtime support libraries. There's um, very low level support, um, which provides foundation building blocks for exceptions type info, um, a demangler so that um, C++ mangle names can be um, uh, converted back into something representable to a user. Um, in the GCC world, this is called libsup C++. Um, in 2011, the FreeBSD Foundation and NetBSD Foundation worked together to obtain a BSD-licensed uh, C++ runtime from PathScale. Um, that's called libcxxrt. And subsequently, there's also been a, um, an open-sourced version uh, in the LLVM uh, project called libcxxabi. It didn't exist when we first did this work, uh, but it, it does now. The standard library in C++, uh, so it's, it, the collection of you know, classes and functions for containers uh, and operations on those containers like sorting and strings and streams uh, and things like that. Um, the uh, lib standard C++ that we have in the tree comes from the old GCC or comes along with the old GCC that we had and it predates C++11. So uh, we have now lib C++, well um, for six years we have lib C++. Um, that is following along and, and updated with all of uh, uh, ongoing C standard, newer C++ standards. Uh, and libc++ is, is C++11 code itself and can't be compiled with the old ancient GCC that we have in the tree. Um, so if you build, say, MIPS with the old GCC, it, that build will include lib, GC, uh, lib standard C++. If you build MIPS with a out of tree C++11 GCC compiler, it will use um, libc++ as well. And the reason we want to use libc++ uh, on all of the architectures, even if GCC is the normal compiler, is so that we can, um, we can share the same C++ library in general and use, uh, avoid ABI incompatibility. Also, uh, along with, primarily for C++ is exception unwinding. Uh, unwinding. But it's, it's used by C code as well for cases like um, forced pthread cleanup. This ties into the, the libgcc that I mentioned earlier, and it's a little bit awkward because you want only one copy of the exception unwinder in, um, in any one process, which is why there's this combination of libgcc.a, libgcc underscore s.so, and libgcc underscore eh.so. Um, and that also pre pre prevented us originally from switching the shared versions of these to use the LLVM provided ones because there wasn't a replacement unwinder for us. Um, we're now using LLVM's lib unwind. This is it came out of Apple as well. It was you know they they realized there was one piece missing um, from a uh, a fully licensed runtime stack. So they released it in October 2013, uh, and it you know it it wasn't fully usable yet, but it went through a lot of development upstream, and we've since brought it into FreeBSD, and it now as of um, as of October-ish, provides, uh, it's used as the unwinder in libgcc underscore s. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, sanitizers that come from LLVM. Um, these exist upstream. In FreeBSD right now, 
we we support only the out of out of the box in the tree. We support only the address sanitizer and undefined behavior sanitizer. So these are used. Uh, these can be used as a replacement for tools like Valgrind to find errors in your your program at runtime. And finally, OpenMP. Um, so OpenMP is a uh, it's a shared um, shared uh, memory API for parallel programming and. In the GCC world, it's provided. the The runtime is provided by libgomp. Um, in FreeBSD, we had Clang. If you if you asked for OpenMP support, it would link against libgomp, but it actually didn't do anything, so it was relatively useless. Um, it now uh, it it now uh, will link against. Uh, LLVM's libomp, which was initially donated by Intel and called libiomp at the at the time. Um, so the clang in, in the base system will link against uh, and it emit calls for libomp for openmp open support. And we provide a, a port called devel slash openmp to provide that runtime library. The goal is to include um, the openmp runtime in the base system for exactly this reason, well, for many reasons, um, but b th this is kind of the, the highlight of the problem that we face. Um, we want the tool chain to be able to be usable for actual end user cases, um, and this, this comes up fairly regularly, that when you build arbitrary software using the defaults out of the box on FreeBSD, OpenMP support doesn't work and things don't perform as well. And it's relatively straightforward to, to, um, to build and install the, the OpenMP runtime, but we have all the rest of the tool chain in the base system. There's not really a, a good reason for us to say we don't want to, uh, to provide the, the runtime um, and you have to do the run through, jump through some extra hoops to get your, um, your code to, to run quickly. And finally, here's a list of the, the folks who have been uh, heavily involved in the tool chain uh, over time. So I just want to put them up here and uh, Call them out for uh, all the all the work that's gone into this uh, over the last mm, seven or eight years. Okay, thank you. So I noticed on your um, time frame slides there was one similarity in all of them, and that was Spark Six Four is. Eh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, th there's, there's a faction of FreeBSD developers and users who wish to e eject uh, Spark 64 from the tree. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't consider myself among that group, but my take on it is um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to leave it there uh, as long as someone wants to maintain or um, keep it building. Um, if no one else has an interest in uh, in doing so, then I mean it, it clearly um, won't be uh, sticking around. If if it won't remain in the tree, if uh, it it becomes unbuildable and, and no one takes an interest in it. One of the problems we have in FreeBSD with Spark 64 is we haven't updated. Uh, we don't support any recent Spark 64 hardware. So the only thing we support um, is is hardware that has been obsolete for sort of more than a decade. Um, so it's not a particularly interesting platform for us. Um, so L the Spark 64 support that exists in LLVM and Clang is exceedingly basic and minimal and um, I don't know, Rafael do, you, Rafael, do you know if that's going to be even maintained? Like I... There's like Movidius, I think they use a Spark 4, so uh -huh. they added whatever they needed to be working, but that's a deep embedded system. Yeah. I don't think there's... So, I mean, I, I think... I think Spark 64 support in upstream LLVM is really going to depend on you guys, uh, OpenBSD guys and NetBSD guys pursuing it if, if that is really, uh, really something um, you want to do. Uh, for us, I think we're, we're more than happy to say, um, you know, for, for, for as long as Spark 64 support remains in FreeBSD, it's going to require an external tool chain. Anyone else?
Sure. So for open PSD trace on open PSD, how do you guys do user defined uh, probes? I have absolutely no idea. I'm just working with the guy who works with all oh. the CDF tools. Okay. The, qu the question was how does OpenBSD handle user defined probes in the tool chain that they're working on? Um, and Baptiste doesn't know. Mark? Oh, yeah. Well, the, it's uh, the only the only wrote the, uh, so you have a header, the uh, The question is, will LLDB be backwards compatible with GNU de remote debugging protocols? Uh, yes, it, it already is. It uses the same, um, it uses the same basic set of, uh, the same basic protocol as GDB does for when GDB talks to its remote stub. Um, there are a couple of extensions that have been added for LLVM. So when LLVM is talking to its own debug server, um, it, it uses a few things that don't exist in the, in the regular GDB protocol. Uh, but broadly speaking, it should be compatible and can be, you know, if it, if it isn't, it can probably be, be uh, considered a bug and, and fixed as opposed to just an architectural mismatch. Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much. So for those who didn't catch it, um, Alan just, well, just very much at noon left. There is a ZFS session, well, uh, bit of further session, way in 11.10. And here you're going to have um, my I think, who's going to host a BSD user, user development session. Well, both sessions. So. You have time to grab a bite. If you want to come back, welcome. Otherwise, everybody has to be back in the session for 1.30. Thanks. Close there. Um. Yo. Oh, keep the wallet. <laughs> you should leave it. No. <laughs> <laughs>